In the first half of 1939, the British decided that they were going to improve upon the A-13 cruiser Christie tanks that were then in production. The result was a very sleek looking Covenanter, the A-13 Mark III. To boost production in this critical time of need, the Ministry of Supply went to Lord Nuffield of Nuffield Mechanization and Aero Company and asked them to join in the production contracts. Lord Nuffield said no. And in a manner perhaps reminiscent of that of North American Aviation when they were asked by the British to build P-40s, said, but I will do better. I will build you a tank of my own design that is better than your tank. Well, being kind of hard up for tanks, the Ministry of Supply acceded to this request and so began the development of the Cruiser A-15, the Cruiser Mark VI. Later on, it was given the name Crusader and it became an iconic tank of the Desert War. Welcome back to the Tank Museum in Bovington and the tour of their Crusader Mark III. Now, before we continue, I'd better explain the case of measles that this tank has developed. They're 3D scanning it, and we came along and we kicked the scanning crew off so we could make this film. However, we were not sufficiently cruel to ask them to remove all those individual dots and then put them back on again. Anyway, back to the story. Nuffield decided, in the interest of expediency, to start with the basis of the earlier A13s. This shaved sufficient time off the development process that the first Crusaders arrived for testing in April of 1940, about a month and a half before the first Covenanter arrived. Crusader 1 was a five-man crew with a two-pounder gun, three-man in the turret, a driver, and a bow gunner in a suicidally small turret on the front left corner. This was quickly deleted. Now, the two-pounder may have been a fantastic gun in 1939, but it was becoming obvious that this gun was going very rapidly out of style. Now, the good news was that the British had actually designed the six-pounder before the war. The bad news was that they didn't see the point in spending the money to produce any. And after Dunkirk happened, well, they couldn't afford to stop producing two-pounders long enough to retool for the six-pounder. Thus, it wasn't until 1941 that production of the six-pounder entered full swing, and it was December of 41 before the decision was made to design a tank to put the gun into. Crusader Mark III, the six-pounder version, entered production in summer of 42, which places it on the timeline somewhere in between the M3 and M4 American mediums, if you want to make a comparison, a little bit closer to the M4. The tank is of a composite construction. The idea was that they were going to have a soft steel interior that could be welded without affecting the integrity of the metal and then have the armor plate added on top of that. But in the end, they just stuck with riveting anyway. The overall weight of the tank was supposed to be kept to 18 tons, the limit of army bridging at the time, whilst maintaining about a four centimeters equivalency of armor. This means that your typical plate is not much over 20 millimeters. Indeed, the nearly horizontal upper slope here is only about nine millimeters, but it does get reasonably thicker to about 30 for the driver's box with the soft steel interior. Components on the front, well, it's marker light. The track tensioning, it looks like they stole an idea from the Soviet T-34. You go through here and it appears to be a worm drive for the idler at the front. Lifting eye, Mount for a towing clevis. The headlights now come with brush guards to protect against going through trees and bushes, whatever else you feel like you can just run over. Uh, as you go a little bit further forward, you'll see the driver's hood. He's got a couple of ports. One is for vision, the other one is actually a pistol port, just in case he is feeling particularly courageous. They extended the hull a little bit to fit the improved Liberty engine, and this allowed the installation of a fifth road wheel pair. The road wheels, well, they were originally made of aluminium or aluminum. Uh, interestingly, history of that word, apparently it's one of the few words the Americans get right. But regardless, aluminium was of high value for aircraft manufacture, so they eventually changed to pressed steel. 
The suspension is of the Christie type, of course, and this means that the springs are located sandwiched in between an outer and inner plate of armor, which is highly inconvenient for two reasons. A, you're taking up space, so the interior volume of this tank is not as wide as the outside dimensions might indicate. Secondly, if you have to get at one of these springs, you're in some serious work. Because you have to remove the tracks, you've got to remove the wheels. You then have to remove the side skirts and the bins. They're all bolted together. And then finally you can get at the armor plate and pull that off. As I say, highly inconvenient. There is ample stowage as you move up on the sponson bins and there's an additional small bin on the turret rear. And on the right hand side of the turret you will see a spotlight. Things at the back of the tank. Well, you are going to notice that attached to the towing hook at the rear is a rota trailer. And we will come back to that one a little later. You'll also see a mounting point for an auxiliary fuel tank. It's about 30 imperial gallons. That was especially if you didn't want to tow a rota trailer for whatever reason. On the left hand side, you're going to see a fill up port down at the bottom for the final drive lubrication system. And what I can only assume is a what were they thinking moment on the right rear. And of course, there's one on the far side as well. What you were looking at here is the air cleaner system. The filter is here, the intake is here. Well, it's actually three of them per side. Now, if you were going to try to deliberately come up with a spot on the tank that is most likely to receive dust and dirt, I think you would do very hard to come up with a better place than directly above the track at the back. Because imagine this tank is trundling along at about 30 miles an hour in the desert and dust is coming up. Well, anybody who's driven a convertible realizes that as a wind block moves forward, it creates a vacuum, which is then filled by a vortex, which comes back so there's actually wind going forwards directly behind the vehicle, not backwards. And of course, this is going forwards right into the air intakes. What were they thinking? The back deck, nice and flat. I'm standing on top of the Wilson Epicyclic steering system. A little bit further forward under this hatch is the Liberty Mark III. Now this is a derivative of the World War I tank engine. It's a V12 27 liter, puts out a reasonable 340 horsepower. This will push the tank, which is now 19 tons, along at a 27 mile an hour clip, which is pretty good, especially when you consider that the Christie suspension will allow it to maintain a good speed off-road. The catch is that the Liberty isn't so much of an engine block as it is a whole bunch of cylinders bolted together and over time, the vibrations would start to work the parts loose. Add to that further problems. For example, sand getting into the cooling system would affect the white metal parts. The radiator fans, well, their drive was always unreliable. This has got the chain system. Later, they moved to a shaft. As a result of all this, the tank did not exactly establish a reputation for reliability. As you move outboard, there is fuel tanks for about 110 gallons, imperial of course, of petrol. And this was estimated to get the tank about 100 miles off uh, on the roads. A little bit in board of that, you can just see the two angled radiator fans. Finally, I am going to go back to the rotor trailer. Now I can't do any better at explaining this thing than David Fletcher did during Operation Think Tank back in about 2012. So that said, I'll hand over the video to him and I'll see you on the next one. All right, I'm, I'm gonna change gears here and go on to what I know has got to be your favorite subject ever. <laughs> given given, your, given I, I have heard you speak uh, with great passion about your opinion on this device, the Rota trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a good idea at the beginning. I mean, we've all seen M4s towing um, extra ammunition, and of course, there's nothing wrong with towing fuel behind because that's what the Sherman Crocodile did. So, wh why, why is the why does the rotor trailer have such a place in your heart? Okay, that's useless. Um, 
Put it in perspective to begin with, I firmly believe that no tank should ever be expected to pull a trailer. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. asking for trouble. And going backwards is a nightmare. <laughs> but among all these things, the rotor trailer is an exception. It is totally useless, pulled or pushed in any direction. <laughs> um, if you've never come across one, or ever seen one, it's a metal box. Um, with no springs, well, what springs, um, and the container that the box consists of has compartments for ammunition, one compartment for a fuel pump, and the wheels, which have solid rubber tires on them, are hemispherical discs that you fill with fuel. So you tow this thing behind your tank, you've got fuel, you've got to pump the pump the fuel into the tank, and you've got ammunition bouncing about in this lovely metal box. Um, they have three problems with it. First of all, the, the wheels leak. <laughs> so just when you need it, there's no gas left in the wheels. Secondly, because it has no springs, it bounces over every stone or rut it can find until the ammunition is so bent and battered you can't use it. And they said the worst thing of all was after a while it will bounce three or four times and turn upside down. <laughs> um, that would twist the rod that was holding it onto the tank, make it nearly impossible to detach it. So you've now not only crippled the tank, it's got nothing to move with or fight with. So yeah, that's the, my favorite reason for eating them, if you like. <laughs> Incidentally, I met a, an a elderly American officer in, at Bobbington a few years ago, and he belonged to a unit, which was an Anglo-American <laughs> Anglo unit, and it was, what they'd done, they trawled the army for farm boys. And the idea was that these guys would go over in the wake of the invasion forces and get the harvest in. Um, they obviously didn't know the French because they were already out there plowing and harvesting while the battle's going on, more or less. But they, these guys were issued with rotor trailers to go with their tractors to give them fuel. So that's the only account I've ever heard of anyone actually being issued with them and for a while, having never had to test them, actually liking them.